I ask again, as I've asked a thousand times. Speak to me. What more would you have me do? Is there no prayer that will reach you? No mark that will break your bonds? Ah! I can't help you if you won't speak! A whisper is all I ask. To guide me. Hello greater YouTube area and the surrounding internet regions this is Killer Cardinal DA7. All right, a little backstory on this particular video before I begin. I'm going to put a timestamp link in the description in case you want to skip ahead to the discussion and don't care about the process. In the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal that broke last year and the ongoing string of revelations of sexual misconduct among male celebrities, I had begun working on a script for a video about sexual harassment, sexual assault, and similar related issues. As I included more and more angles and analysis in the discussion, it was becoming harder and harder to wrap my head around everything I was planning on saying in a single video. Thus, in putting off recording it and trying to figure out if, more likely how, to split it into two or more pieces, I worked on other things, like the video I did about Warframe and microtransactions, as well as the last one about the division and dying light. I also began working on repurposing the blog post that I mentioned in the video, Black Gamer Lives Matter Gate, and for a little bit that was taking shape, but like the videos on sexual harassment I'm going to put out eventually, it was also becoming large and in need of splitting up. The original blog post I had written featured a heavy analysis on religion, so I decided to take most of the parts about religion out, pair that analysis up with a more common arrival in evolution and create something much more focused. I'll reveal the original intention next time, but for now, I want this video to serve as an in-depth layman's analysis of religion, primarily Christianity, mostly because that's the one I have the most experience with, and how it interacts with evolution. In other words, I want to ask questions and pose ideas, but with as little scholarly level research as possible. Not that research is bad, I just haven't done much, and overall, there isn't much research I can do that will make the other side see things as conclusive. Most of it has already been kicked around and cited already anyways, with little movement. The kicker is, I want to do my analysis in a way that doesn't assume that the things religion believes and says can't possibly be true. If I'm going to dig into religion heavily, I want to at least try to respect people's right to continue believing what they like, especially since I can't entirely disprove the existence of deities, gods, spirits, ghosts, monsters, or whatever else. I can assess what this or that book says about history, what they claimed happened many years ago, I can dispute claims and arguments made by religious people with logic and the right questions, suggest what type of midway we can all reach, but if otherworldly beings really are out there somewhere, they're out there and I don't know what to do about them. In case I haven't stated it before, at this point in my life I identify as an agnostic, which Google defines as a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God or of anything beyond material phenomena, a person who claims neither faith nor disbelief in God. So yeah, I'm cynical about otherworldly phenomena and hopefully I can show religious people why it's reasonable to be cynical. However, there may be someone or something out there that we can't put our fingers on. Is it the exact God that is described in the Bible? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's something just not as it's described in the Bible. Maybe Maybe it functions the same but isn't called God. I have no idea, but my mind is open to different possibilities. Like I said, all I can do is look at what is said about religion, see where truth and logic could lie, and where there are gaping holes. Obviously, when it comes to faith, with all due respect, those gaping holes are going to gape something fierce. But that comes with having faith in anything. Not everything is explained. The question is, which gaping holes matter in terms of dealing with others? And which gaping holes can we attribute to the simple act of hoping something that you can't see is real? Which present distinct problems functioning in a free society? And which just come with the territory of faith? With all that out of the way, what better place to start than right at the beginning of life itself? Here's an area where both religion and evolution are actually a bit similar, and that they both have a far-fetched explanation for how life started. In the evolution camp, one of the primary theories is that of the quote, primordial soup. I put a link in the description to Wikipedia about this, but basically what it states is that billions of years ago, simple non-living molecules came together in a body of water under the natural radiation of the atmosphere and formed greater structures like atoms and single-celled organisms. Jury still seems out on this, as I also linked in the description an article from Wired.com from 2009 saying the soup has been successful fully reproduced, while another article from phys.org, phys.org, from a year later says attempts to reproduce it failed. I will admit, while I lean more toward the evolution side of things when figuring out how life got to this point, the beginning being explained by a soup is a bit convenient. That stuff just combined together and started to live and develop instinct and eventually sentience. Then again, genuine question, not at all rhetorical, how many other logical scientific answers could there be for how single-celled organisms gained that spark of life to start this whole thing? Far-fetched as it may be, I'm unaware of how else to logically explain how nutrients and chemicals came together to form living things. Amoebas and paramecia and euglenas came long before things like temptation and desire and emotion existed. They 
didn't need to be sentient or have complex thoughts. They just needed to seek out enough nourishment to split and reproduce. Complex brains developed a little later. Meanwhile, religious people tell us of a guy that waved his hand over some sand and dirt and made the first human being, then took a rib from that human being and made a second human being. This all after deciding on the first day, quote, let there be light, and then several other decisions to create the earth and animals, the Garden of Eden, etc. So either you have evolution, which starts out really weird, but is at least a little logical, or religion, which is almost impossible, but explains way more than just creation perfectly. I may not be religious, but I get why people have faith in that. It wraps things up pretty nicely. There's a lot more risk of it being wrong, but if it's right, it covers most things a person could question about life. Now, evolution's best explanation for how life started may be far-fetched, but in a way, so is the idea that those single-celled organisms occasionally mutated upon reproduction, that those mutations that made the archetype stronger hung around while the previous iterations died out, then new mutations occurred that led to bigger changes, like sea creatures gaining the ability to live on land, grow to different sizes, walk upright, fly. All of it is based on chance, rolling of the genetic dice, which is why and how religion and its believers tend to poke holes in it. People aren't always so comfortable with the idea that life functions with that level of randomness built in, that nature and creatures have autonomy without being directly controlled or guided by larger forces. Even if a person isn't formally religious or doesn't worship one or more gods, though, they still sometimes need to believe in more organized systems. For example, karma, aka what goes around comes around. The idea that if you do good things, the universe will reward you, and if you do bad things, eventually badness will then come back at you. Unfortunately, the good guys get fucked over pretty badly, and the bad guys win a lot of the time, so a lot of people tend to believe in this as a way to feel better when others do bad things to them. A sort of patient, casual revenge. There's fate and destiny. General ideas were meant to be with certain people and certain places places, do certain things, etc. Overall, they offer way more leeway than karma, which is more specifically focused to certain circumstances. Personally, I look at fate a little like pro wrestling. Both of those things are fabricated, and even though we can sometimes look at patterns and signs to predict how they'll end up, there's no real way of telling if we'll be right outside of just seeing what happens. Thus, fate and destiny are really only relevant to us if we distinctly know what our exact fate or destiny will be, and fictional as he may have been, take a look at Oedipus Rex to see what happens when you know your destiny. I'd bet, even if it didn't involve having sex with a parent, most of us would instinctively fight against our future, especially if we were told it was even mildly unpleasant. Then again, fate is like the idea that, quote, everything happens for a reason. That even if we have bad stuff happen to us, if we suffer tragedies or bad luck, whatever, there's an intention behind it. It's purposeful. Maybe we learn something, we grow or change course. I think this is similar to karma in that depending on a reason being present in everything that happens to us may yield only false hope. It seems rock solid, but saying there's a reason behind everything assumes or hopes that someone's running the show. But usually who that being actually is gets left out of that discussion. Evolution certainly doesn't explain that part. It's just a set of scientific ideas and data that show what species existed. It doesn't explain who runs the universe, if anybody, who defines morals, who sets standards of behavior, etc. That's where religion comes in to kind of wrangle things into a more organized system, as it covers most of that and puts a name to who's in charge. Fate? God's divine plan. Everything happens for a reason that he dictates. Karma? Heaven and hell. You do things right, you go to paradise. You do things wrong, you get sent to the lake of fire. Creation? Adam and Eve. I have to say the nice thing about creation, it does away with all the randomness and just shoots straight to the good part. It comes standard with the idea that humans are at the top of the food chain instead of implying we used to be monkeys, which some people see as so much of an insult that it can't be possible when it's not impossible in the slightest. Just because an individual person didn't used to be a literal monkey, that doesn't mean homo sapiens as we know them didn't exist on earth as something else. Many religious people believe that God and the circumstances created for us are all intelligently built. And yet there are plenty of things that show us just how dumb God would have had to be in order to create create humans working the way we do. You mind explaining to me why God made our feeding tube the same as our breathing tube? We need both oxygen and food to live, yet someone intelligently decided that it would be brilliant architecture to make us intake those things to the same spot because, let's face it, thousands of people a year don't get things caught in their throats and suffocate, do they? Check the link in the description. They sure do. A religious person might say, that's just God testing us. What is he testing? Our ability to eat slower with smaller bites? If we're intelligently built by a conscious, omniscient being, that's not a test. It's a really bad mistake. And to me, it's fine if God is flawed, but people think he's perfect, that everything he does makes sense. I won't tell you God God isn't real, but any God I believe in is likely just as flawed as we are. How about the fact that our bodies are made up of water, yet when we drink pure water, we piss out at least half of it? We eat solid foods and only extract the smallest bits of nutrients and shit out the rest. What's intelligent about any of that? Some of you may not be aware, there are parts of our bodies that serve no real purpose, parts we either don't need, don't use, or cause us more problems than they help. And while they may not conclusively prove we got here through evolution, they don't help the 
idea that God built humans intelligently from the ground up as I'd love to hear a strong enough believer tell me why we need our appendix. WebMD says, quote, one theory is that the appendix acts as a storehouse for good bacteria, rebooting the digestive system after diarrheal illnesses. But in the same paragraph, quote, surgical removal of the appendix causes no observable health problems. Anybody you know thankful to God for their wisdom teeth? I think not. God just wanted us to have extra pieces, I guess. How about this little gem? Ever hear of the sinoatrial or atrioventricular nodes? Those are two little spots on different sides of the heart that when stimulated by the brain and nervous system cause our hearts to beat in the typical rhythm we know and love, sing it with me, dum dum, dum dum, dum dum, dum dum. That's one node firing and then the other firing right after, causing the muscles in the heart to constrict in such a way that it pumps blood, moving oxygen taken in by the lungs to everywhere it needs to go in the body. If one or both of those little electrical nodes are off or if one or more stops working, if they don't fire in that standard tempo, we get arrhythmias, high or low blood pressure, or our heart stops. Now without blood flow, no more oxygen to the brain, and we die. Human beings are exceptionally fragile, delicate, and can be killed by the smallest possible virus or bacteria or infection. Even people who subsist on kale smoothies and spin classes have trouble staying alive, and they obsess over health. We live in a body that can essentially stop working whenever it feels like it. A body that mostly functions on its own, even when we're not consciously making it do things. We have brains that constantly guide us in directions we believe are the best for us when they're subconsciously self-destructive, harmful, and unproductive to growth. When we can perish in that immense amount of ways, some of them a result of our minds leading us to our own demises, God really should have put humans through some quality control. But that's the problem with attributing this to one being. We're supposed to be responsible for our bodies. After all, the body is God's gift to us. We are to treat it like a temple. But when you look at the human body on its own, not compared to other animals, it's so extremely flawed. Evolution on the whole is mainly just an explanation of how we survived this long, what species and beings preceded us. Even though religion and evolution regularly battle each other, religion is arguably much broader. Evolution doesn't have any moral or ethical rules attached, no dictation of how to live our lives, not even any guidelines on how to encourage further evolution down the road. In fact, at the point we're at now, human evolution is largely halted. It's predicated on the idea that mutations occur during reproduction and maybe the resulting child ends up better or stronger or smarter or faster than the parents, or that they have some new feature that allows them to be more capable in the wild. They're better at identifying food sources or water or things that need to stay alive. Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest, is often misconstrued this way, that the quote, fittest are the best and brightest, but what it's technically referring to is reproductive success, the ones that breed the most. Of course, the most capable in the wild would likely be around longer to breed more. Thus, while jackrabbits and cockroaches are not thought of as predators with a wealth of defensive tools, they are well known for breeding. And if they're allowed to breed while humans are busy murdering and killing each other over what bathrooms people are allowed to use or what cake shops people can buy pastries from, more on both of those things to come, then I guess at least one of them really will survive the apocalypse, as people say. Humans develop new technology, but our natural human bodies aren't coming out of wombs or hospitals much different than they have been for quite a long while. And if they are, we're often confused by it and seek to bring that new life to our usual standard of living. That being said though, randomness and chaos are still interwoven into our lives. If you have any children of your own, or if you ever wanted to have one or more, raise a child, conceive a child, give birth to a child, you absolutely have to make peace with some degree of randomness occurring. You can argue that if your child is born with physical defects, if your child grows up to be a delinquent or even a criminal, shit, even simple stuff like, I wanted a boy, our kid came out a girl, or my kid is going to make great grandkids one day, only to find out our kid doesn't want kids. You can see all those things as God's divine plan for you, but that's all just an assumption. Granted, I understand that's where faith comes in to fill in that hole with an explanation, that's a big hole to cover with something as light as an assumption. In religion, someone is always responsible for the things that occur. Why is the world not allowed to function on its own? We're supposedly given the gift of free will, yet we're always reminded that things are dictated by God's divine plan. Which is it? Free will and everything we do gets us punished? Or we have control over nothing and God just toys with us at every step? Now, while I doubt the intelligence and or responsibility of God, or at the very least doubt the assumption by humans that God built us intelligently, is that to suggest that evolution is smart? Hell no. Evolution isn't smart. There's no one running the show with evolution. It's a completely dumb, random process. True, evolved creatures do develop certain traits that have practical function to sometimes give them an edge, but there are usually drawbacks. There's no perfect beings. Humans are lucky to have made it this far in the form we did. We develop technology like guns and fighting styles like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and hone our minds and energies because we don't have the heightened senses or long teeth like wolves and tigers have. The stuff I cited moments ago, the parts of our bodies that don't serve any purpose, the assumption is that they used to serve a purpose in a previous evolutionary iteration, but in our current forms, they don't do anything significant except cause a strain. If I'm religious, I can look to the sky and go, uh, hey God, mind telling me why my food can get stuck in my throat and kill me? Did you even proofread this blueprint? Only to get no answer. But with evolution, no one was responsible for that incredible anatomical problem, so there's no one to really ask. 
It's a dumb problem that unfortunately hung around. However, despite the immense possibilities that come with the randomness and chaos of nature, that doesn't mean it's impossible that someone or something guides nature to do what it does in some way or another. I mentioned several videos ago that I'm a Libra, and when I think back to my youngest memories, I remember countless times recognizing and acknowledging balance, both among people and internally, long before I made the connection that Libra symbols the scales. Even though most firmly religious people look at things like astrology as phony magic talk about funny cards and horoscopes, and arguably there are just as many card-reading charlatans as there are evangelists healing the sick, praise the Lord. The scales have affected my life in far more poignant and direct ways explaining why I do things the way I have always naturally done them than the Bible ever has trying to tell me that I shouldn't want certain things because of the devil or telling me to behave in certain ways that are unfair and condescending to others or else I get punished. And then when I don't do those things as instructed, never inflicting any direct and clear punishment that can't immediately be written off as dumb, horrible luck. So while I can neither confirm nor deny God's existence conclusively, I do firmly believe there are forces beyond our knowledge that influence us in many ways. And to be fair, even though I analyze and criticize religion as I do, religion does offer similarly positive influence to other people. Christianity often falls back on the Ten Commandments, and outside of those first few which George Carlin lovingly described as spooky language, only acknowledging one God, don't have any other strange gods before him, don't take the Lord's name in vain, keep holy the Sabbath day, other than those, the rest are good values. Most can't really argue with that. Granted, most of them are rooted in negatives other than honor thy father and thy mother, but still ultimately good things to encourage in people. Don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat on your spouse, don't look at your neighbor's property or spouse and want them for your own so they don't have them anymore. The one about not killing, I think that should be a little more specific. In fact, most of those good values could probably use some asterisks or elaboration to be clearer, but the main idea is taking it as much face value as possible are pretty solid rules to live by. As much as I and many others find religion's influence in the 12-step program to be more about marketing and potentially preying on vulnerable people needing guidance, the 12-step program has helped people kick addiction. Even though some of those steps are ways of believing in God at the core, some of the steps are rooted in fair ideas like making amends with people you've hurt, admitting your powerlessness while addicted, and taking personal responsibility. The rest, unfortunately, are about ministering to others how the 12 steps have helped, continuing the pyramid scheme, but despite that, being faithful to a religion can offer a person an overall set of rules to stay disciplined, which in and of itself is a good thing. I don't think there's any innate danger in booze or too much sex or naughty fucking language, but at least some of the things religion urges people to stay away from can bring about problems if indulged in too much. Freedom to indulge feels great, no doubt, but sometimes people need need boundaries to stay within and a greater purpose pushing them to do so. Supporting government and your fellow citizens is okay, but worshipping a power that is stronger than human authority has to seem like that greater purpose some people search for. It doesn't even matter what exact religion or faith you belong to. If you believe strongly in a set of rules or circumstances rooted in supernatural phenomena, otherworldly beings, realms beyond the physical, and or you devote yourself to worshipping the god, a god, or many gods, you're practicing faith in some degree of omnipotent higher power. That's kind of hard to sell to most casual adults who didn't grow up religious, or people who live in very real worlds full of very present and immediate dangers, but for most staunchly religious people, it's all they've ever known of morality, ethics, and overall how the world works, what's right and what's wrong. It's something that's learned, usually from parents, guardians, grandparents, family, friends, other quote, trusted individuals. It's ingrained in religious people at young ages, thus questioning those beliefs later in life is either impossible or just not done. Plus, as the internet grants us the ability to connect to millions of other people, many have come to cling to anything that causes them to be shunned by another group in society, and when some of those millions of people have answers to fill in the holes often left by holy books, faith only takes a stronger hold on a believer through that easy-to-gather community. If you ask most religious people if they'd rather be ruled either by human government or the Almighty, I imagine most of them would say the Almighty. But here's the problem. People cannot or should not feel led by someone that does not actively lead. To put it another way, the Bible is a book, like any other religious book. It talks about what God has supposedly said and done thousands of years ago. But words in a book are not actively leading. Action is. If God is truly there, then in my view, he needs to take action. At least take responsibility for disasters and tragedies so humans don't just attribute them to God without knowing if he's really responsible or not. If he's really responsible, super. Though I think he deserves an opportunity to say, wasn't me, bro. A book written by humans is not responsibility. Just like the assumption that he leaves little riddles around our homes and workplaces and stores and restaurants for us to stumble on and figure out for ourselves as proof that he's there. A leader doesn't lead by his or her supporters interpreting everything as their decisions, slapping their name on the side of everything and saying, it's God's will. If God is to be attributed to any actions, at this point, he needs to claim that himself. Otherwise, there is enough doubt in some people's minds that he either may not exist or simply isn't there to enforce the rules he supposedly laid down. I don't know the source of the powers that influence us, but I also 
also don't claim to. People who are fervently religious, however, attribute everything to God. And when people believe that strongly that our world is intelligently built by a being powerful enough to destroy us with a word or a phrase or a wave of his hand, a being that's never physically present in our present day lives, or just not present in some people's lives, unfortunately, that's where we start to see significant problems arise. I realize it must seem utterly blasphemous for me to suggest that God get his ass down here and settle these arguments. I will grant you that wording it that way is pretty obnoxious. I'm going to refrain from going that far. But you have to admit, this petty battling back and forth is hitting a fever pitch. The amount of people who refuse to back down or compromise in any little way are slowly but surely gaining more strength and losing more patience. And if people who lord their lord over others feel content with continuing such a practice, we could really use some direct action from that lord to put this bickering to bed, don't you think? You can cite Bible passages as things God said eons ago, but even if he did say those things, he said them past tense. How does he feel now? Humans wrote down that he said those things thousands of years ago. That was nice of them. But how does God really feel about the internet and stem cells and abortion and healthcare reform and taxes and smartphones and nuclear fucking weapons now? Don't give me interpretations. Don't give me a fable about how God talked to an angel at the water cooler and therefore war is justified. I don't want to hear what humans reported thousands of years ago, told to thousands of other people, then someone decided to write it down before anyone else fucks with the story any more than they already did. Then have a priest or a believer recite it to me and say, well, from what it says here, clearly God is suffering and unhappy because we killed his son and our world is turning into a cesspit. Do you know that for sure? There are plenty of things I said five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole. And do you know why that is? Because over time, my viewpoints change. The world changes. Circumstances change. Standards and behaviors change. And the only way to tell someone how I feel right now is to do just that. Think about how I feel about these things and express it. Tell one person, tell a couple people, tell Facebook, tell the greater YouTube area and the surrounding internet regions. Right now, I have spent far too long being shy and silent and complacent, and I'm working on this YouTube channel to change course and fix just that. You're telling me in the thousands of years since the Bible was written, God still feels exactly the same way as he did all that time ago? Way before smartphones and deprivation tanks and Pilates and Alexa were even conceived? For all we know, God thinks Alexa and tractors are abominations, but how would we fucking know? We're functioning without him in terms of farming for food, building machines, and working for this arbitrary money system which doesn't have any physical value in the world outside of this agreement among most humans that those who have a lot of it have power and those who have barely any apparently don't deserve to live as food, water, or competent health care aren't seen as civil rights. We have government because God is not present enough in our lives to keep order himself. As much as I doubt religion and I think the idea of a monotheistic system of a single monarchical god, or hell, even a polytheistic system like the Greeks and Romans had where a whole cavalcade of folks made the world go around, both of those things are pretty terrifying to a feeble little human like me. It's enough to acknowledge our physical fragility when put next to a panther that can shred us with a swipe of a paw and then pick our bones clean for supper, or a giant elephant that could flatten us with one step, or fuck, even smallpox or other weaponized viruses or diseases. But for all of us to see one or more gods or goddesses or non-gender specific deities, whatever we got out there, every single day with our very eyes and remember just how petty, little, meager, and insignificant we are by comparison, at least in those scenarios, those deities are present. We would talk to them. They would directly respond with actual words and answers. There wouldn't be any of this, I'm going to say my prayers every night, and if what I ask for comes true, then it's proof that my prayer was answered by God himself. If that were a relationship between two humans, most would consider that severely unhealthy. One is pleading for help, the other isn't saying anything. Things get better for the first person, and they're just left to assume their pleas were answered by the second person. Come on. We can bug God with prayers all day and all night, but expecting him to be physically here for us is somehow crossing the line? Why? Because all authorities and the subjects say it's against the rules? Whose rules? gods, or the humans who want to control other humans by concocting an extremely convenient set of restrictions that, quote, explain why God does need to be more active in more lives. Google defines dogma as a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as true to the point of being undeniable and indisputable. In terms of religion, usually that authority is the church. It would be God if he were more directly present, but the church is the best we got. And if it were somehow proven to everyone on the planet beyond any reasonable doubt that this God entity is 100% real and present if he were seen, heard, and witnessed by the masses in present real time, then I think most of us would agree that that would be one indisputable authority. But that hasn't happened yet. Being agnostic, I tend to look at religious practice as something of a hobby, something you do that doesn't have to define you. You believe in it, but take it with a grain of salt just in case it may not be real. Maybe I'm too much of a gamer though. Maybe I spend too much time going on quests with distinct mission parameters that lead to specific loot and prizes at the end. But if I spend as long as a lifetime working in one direction, the entire
entire time carrying with me the assumption that if I do these particular things in the rules that I'll be granted a specific reward, I'd really like some clear evidence that that reward is real and I'm not just being harangued into believing it because particular humans need me to bolster their community's numbers. I get pissed enough if I have to replay a 70 plus hour RPG because I didn't slot in skill points the right way by the time I make it to the final boss. If I went 90 plus years repressing urges, holding myself back from experiencing things I desperately desire, only to find out heaven was a lie, That'd really suck. Most religions and faiths being based on sets of morals and having something of a reward punishment mechanic, I do understand how hard it is for religious people to separate their faith from how they live day to day and why religion is taken so seriously given the immense threat and consequence should you break the rules. But gaming communities are proof positive that humans are corruptible enough to seek out loopholes in any system. Ever since I was a little boy, I asked myself the question, what are the actual requirements to get into heaven? Back then I just figured, the Ten Commandments? Not getting any real answers, I then thought, all right, well, okay, if it's Ten Commandments, how many do I have to follow? All of them? More than half? At least one? Does any one commandment carry more weight than the others? Is it like Richard Simmons' deal meal You only get so many points for sins, and once you run out, you get sent to the lava pit? Like, what if you follow nine of the Ten Commandments, but then you kill someone on accident and it cancels the other out? That'd be really shitty. How does it really work? I decided to do the smart thing, and the other day, I googled it. Lo and behold, I found a wiki how on getting into heaven. Link is in the description, but to summarize, a couple things you should know. First of all, Jesus died on the cross for us, and that takes more precedence over how good we are as human beings. Uh, learning the gospel and historical events of Jesus are both important, but believing he rose from the dead and not actually knowing he did is crucial. Anyway, let's see here. Lots of reading, realization of, quote, good news, believing, worship, acceptance. You'll be happy to know that if you're not a Christian, you can still be saved by coming on over and asking to be in the club. Also, if you've sinned, you need to ask for forgiveness, but there's no guarantee you'll actually be forgiven. That's kind of a wait-and-see situation. And that's about it. So yeah, there it is. Uh, that was the problem when I was little. I didn't have a wiki how. Here's the thing though. Even if the list and the link is the real honest to goodness list, 100%, look up any game that had a high profile glitch or bug or exploit that allowed people to acquire too much currency, too many experience points, too much power, etc. Like in Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, link to a video of this is in the description. They experienced an exploit at one point where people could kill cows and sell the hides for money far too easily, creating an imbalance in the in-game economy. The developers, essentially the gods that control the world from behind the scenes, fix this exploit not by removing cows, but by spawning giant cow monsters to hunt the player down incessantly to stop them from this behavior should they take too much advantage. Link to a video of that is in the description as well. Point is, if there was a loophole to get into heaven, a human would have found it, but we don't even know how many people get into heaven, let alone if any of the supposed guidelines or rules found in WikiHow really work to get you there. It'd be one thing if we had proof of people getting there, we had distinct evidence or family members send back photos, they always want to FaceTime from their cloud, and they tell us that all we have to do is follow the instructions in the wiki how and we're golden. A lot more people would probably start following those rules right away. But you know what they say about rules? They were meant to be broken or at least reinterpreted. If we had proof of people getting into heaven, people would examine it, they would discover some real simple method that technically works, and then you know what would happen? People would be putting up YouTube videos of it, like, hey guys, X Squirrel Girl 420 x here, just want to put out a quick video about how to get into heaven. This has been disputed for thousands and thousands of years, and today I'm going to show you an easy exploit on how to do it. Enjoy the video, hit that like and subscribe button. And then, if humans figured out a loophole for getting into heaven, has anyone ever conceived of what would happen if there was a massive influx of the pearly gates? What would God even do if that many people, quote, earn their way into heaven the easy way? Just let everybody stay because they cracked the code and won the game? Would he be pissed like, hey, hey, what do you think you're doing? You cannot all get in here. That's not how it works. This is ridiculous. And then what? He starts a line at the gate and picks people for random screenings like at the airport and whoever isn't up to snuff gets dropped through a trap door into the fire. He starts handing out refunds and reincarnations because this is total bullshit. I follow the rules. I've been online for fucking 20 earth years. Now you're telling me I can't get in. You're getting a nasty Yelp review, buddy. Religious faith is built on mostly good, positive values, like I said before. I totally stand by that. But some people see so little physical payoff or reward from anything they believe in, they get tired of defending their faith to people who don't believe. And I know, don't even say it. Uh, Killer Cardinal DA7, you're completely shooting holes in my religious beliefs. You're exactly the same as those liberal faith bullies in the mainstream media. Sad, fake news, witch, burn the witch, heretic, stone the heretic. <clears throat> Sorry, that escalated quickly. Anyways, look, I never said I don't want you to believe. I just have a ton of questions no one can answer without a passage or a hand wave. Like, you just have to believe, okay? Hashtag called faith for a reason. I'll admit, faith at the core is also a good thing. I also stand by that. But faith needs to have a backup plan in case it falls through. Because as it stands now, those good values and positive influences that religion grants are turning ugly. And people of different belief systems clash daily. People have the same exact problems of not being able to physically substantiate their beliefs with any real proof or evidence of the
of the world existing the way they see it. For a long time, my temptation has been to say about religion that if a person identifies as being faithful to a particular one, they should follow as many of the rules it dictates as possible. The implication is that one or more deities are telling us to do certain things and live certain ways. The mortal at the front of the room wearing the robe isn't responsible. A celestial deity that is light years more powerful than any feeble human is responsible. The mortal in the robe is the messenger. Okay, so giving that the benefit of the doubt doesn't seem like there's much wiggle room, but neither the consequences that people are threatened with, eternal damnation in another realm, nor the reward, paradise, eternal life, reunion with past relatives and friends, can be proven outside of what one or more humans described in a book written a long time ago. It's all reliant on faith encouraged by humans who don't have any degree of proof to show why others should follow those rules, which is why attacks occur, which is why bashing and slamming other people publicly for their actions, judging people even though God and the Bible tell you not to, are so common. There isn't any other way to argue in favor of religion, so what's left? Just attempting to debunk scientific fact, which is near impossible without the right equipment, questioning the piety of celebrity who religious people already consider shameful, and of course, war. And let me read it right here because I'm sure if a religious person is watching this, they're probably starting to get angry. I'm doing the best I can in this video to both acknowledge the possibility that God exists and respecting the validity of those who reason their way through not believing in him. Part of the problem though is that the best proof of what God feels or what God thinks is often inconsistent in how he's presented to us as a person. He has all sorts of human traits, but what kind of human would he be? Also not rhetorical. The only thing we have to tell us what type of personality God has is what we read in the Bible about what he's said and done. Writers, by the way, call that character development. And to be honest, God seems like a really troubled guy. Unstable, chaotic, bipolar, sometimes loving and caring, and other times tyrannical, violent, vicious, and deceptive. Which might be fine if God were a real life monarch that you could visit and talk to and have him actually physically answer you, you know, like a conversation. If you visit a real life king, kneel before him and say, please, my family needs money and food. And the king goes, I will think about this and let you know in three days. That's still more of an answer you'll get than praying, which has no chance of getting a direct answer or knowing if you'll get anything, let alone what you ask for. If God can't be physically seen or heard to enforce his authority, he's acting like Superman in the Fortress of Solitude. He has the power to do real good in the world to keep people safe and ensure they're happy and comfortable. And not only is he consciously allowing horrible things to occur down here on earth, but allowing people to interpret things that may have controllable or preventable effects as his doing and not showing up to take credit or absolve himself while people think this is making him more and more culpable if he really is there. Without any real consequence, Consequence, it's no wonder so many people create alternate sects of religion that don't follow every word and obey every law and change the rules to whatever they like. How does he feel about that? Is he okay with people cherry picking out of the Bible however they want? He sure should not doing anything direct to clarify if he's angry at people for disobeying or if he's kind of cool that as long as it's in his name, whatever, it's all good. God is often called the Heavenly Father, but to me, God doesn't directly discipline us nearly as much as he should to prove he's as present in everyone's lives as a good father should be. If he is disciplining us, he's not present enough to leave a significant enough mark to prove it was really him. He's like a deadbeat dad. He made us, we send him text messages, he doesn't answer, we visit his house once a week for an hour, the entire time he's busy working, and when we act out he gets pissed, he summons a tornado, we hardly know what his face looked like or what happened, then he remembers he brought us a gift, so he leaves us a book by the door with a sticky note on our way out. Here's a bottom line for you, the best possible way I can find to both acknowledge religion and those that doubt. The fact that we can doubt God's existence at all may not prove conclusively that God doesn't exist, he very well might, but ultimately there should be nothing allowing for doubt in such a huge entity. That doubt that does exist proves that God's presence isn't nearly as undeniable or indisputable in some people's lives that he can be used as a catalyst for policy and law that affects everyone, especially in a country that hangs its hat on freedom. That's what a lot of people don't understand about freedom. The greater idea of freedom requires all of us to accept that in order for our citizens to be free to choose for ourselves, there needs to be a base level of tolerance for each other's freedom. We need to start supporting each other's ways of life as long as we're not hurting, maiming, killing, or mistreating each other to extreme degrees. I'm not going to assume it's possible for everyone to feel respected by every single other person. Even if we somehow miraculously manage to get America together on the same page, plenty of other countries will not agree with us or see things as we do. And when our country meets another country in harsh enough ideological conflict, yeah, well, just look into history and see what that can bring about. Here's the M. Night Shyamalan bit, the twist ending. When it comes to religion and evolution, these two things do not, and I repeat, do not need to be at war. They're not mutually exclusive, and I desperately need to write down what that means because I always forget. Not mutually exclusive means you can have both. These two things, religion and evolution, both leave stuff out. There's stuff they either don't explain or can't explain or maybe just haven't explained yet. As a result, they can absolutely coexist. Is it possible that there's a deity out there that only offered the tiniest spark of life to the very first single-celled organism and evolution took the reins from there for millions of years? Why not? Is it possible that non-living molecules and nutrients came together with natural energies, then God came along, dropped his son off of the curb, we killed his ass, and since then he's been bringing the thunder silently from far away? Why not? 
There are two tricks here that we need to keep in mind though. Number one, evolution took place. We have distinct biological proof of it happening. We can see species very slowly, but very surely developing more traits and changing over time through fossils and remnants left behind by these species. And although that part at the beginning of time is a little sketchy, the rest of it is pretty concrete. However, much like studying anything else in history, like tragedies, great and personal, it only explains what happened. It doesn't detail what's presently fair, what's right, what's unfair, and what's wrong. Number two, religion seeks to both explain what happened and what presently should be accepted as the rules. However, the only way we can determine the rules religion tells us is what's written in a book a long time ago, no other current account of how God felt yesterday or a week ago, and to trust the strongest believers with their personal interpretations of Bible passages. We have no real way to get any distinct feedback from the one or more deities out there that dictate said rules. And since religion has a different view of how humans came to be, these two things constantly battle it out. Like so many other things in the world, while these two things have all the conceivable room to work together and coexist, it ultimately comes down to people wanting a reason to fight. Some people identify as God's soldiers. Other people identify as not relying on God and instead study science. Until people learn to tolerate each other, the arguments here will go absolutely nowhere. And they need to get somewhere. I'm really not looking forward to a worldwide holy war, are you? This is Killer Cardinal DA7 reminding you to use your head, be nice to each other, and take the time to think. Talk to you later. Grasp your grief, my hunters, and kill it! For our kin seize the fate all Banuk long for, falling with their spears striking steel. Their struggle is over now. You have witnessed their spirits rise up into the blue sky, and beyond to the blue light. But our struggle is only beginning. Soon, we will again take up the hunt against the daemon that frenzies the machines against us. And so I ask you, can you summon the courage of our fallen kin? Will you fight? And die, as well as they did! My courage! My spear! Our blood is in your teeth, Oratok! We are Banuk. Our enemies. Our prey.